So I guess what I should say is hello, Nashville, right? So there you go. Right? We got all the entertainers. It was great last night. And I hope you all had a good time. Uh, this session is on electronic door hardware and um, various things that have gone on in the last, say, four years, I'd say, when uh, the committee originally got together to suggest some changes in the, um, in the CSI format. And then there's been some interesting back and forth on that. And so we have an excellent panel. We'll go to that in just a second. Um, we're being recorded. Um, where did you put the, oh, okay, we've got two microphones here, so one of them may wander around a bit uh, because we want the questions recorded as well. So please uh, respect that and we'll hand around the microphone and, and you can ask your questions, that sort of thing, and then we'll, we'll move it around. And um, Steve, you're, you know, can I give you one of those? I'm gonna steal this. You guys are gonna hand that back and forth. And if you'll keep this one off, and, and there's the on-off button, okay? And so thank you, everybody. Um, thanks for being here. And uh, I guess I have a, a question. Phil was, was hoping to perceive um, what our mix of audience is. So how many folks in here are manufacturers? And they're all at the same table. <laughs> Got you. We're sharing notes, we've got you guys packaged, right? Okay, that's good. All right. Uh, how many people are integration? Oh, we can say all the things we want about them. How many are architects, by the way? Oh, good, I can do all my architect jokes. Okay. Uh, it's like, in our business, I think architect jokes are kind of like uh, lawyer jokes, right? I mean, you know. And so, how many people are consultants? There we go. Fantastic. All right, um, let's see if this changes here. Uh, this is our panel. I've got short bios here, but, um, uh, and, and so I'm not gonna read them, and uh, I'm gonna let them introduce themselves when I ask them to give a short, um, I'll say about five minute uh, presentation or, or talk that just says, uh, this is who I am, and here's why I care about what we're talking about and, and some perspective on the issues that we're talking about. So we're going to go into that. Uh, so I'm going to start right there with Eric. And so take the mic, please, and let's go. Hi, I'm Eric Wagner. I've uh, been in the uh, data, fire, and security world for approximately a little shy of 30 years yet. I don't want to make it 30 quite yet. Uh, work for SSOE Group currently. Uh, SSOE Group is a uh, from construction management, all the or from construction management at the end, all the way to uh, master planning at the beginning of a project. Architects, everybody in house, but we also work a lot of times with outside architects and directly with end users. Obviously, uh, cut my teeth at Simplex Grinnell. Uh, did a fire and security project engineer for them here in the Nashville office for 19 years and nine months. Uh, I'm a retired police officer and public safety officer, was a fireman, police officer, and medic for uh, 26 years here in Middle Tennessee. My name is Phil Aronson um, with Aronson Security Group. Um, I have an interesting background, I think, for this discussion. I spent 20 years in the uh, door and lock and hardware industry. Um, and then uh, back in about 2000, I, um, a little bit before that, I uh, got into the electronic security industry. So uh, this has always been an issue um, uh, of coordinating door hardware and electronic and where the, how the two work together. And so, um, and was helped Ray when he uh, worked with the Division 28 and, and, and putting that together and had, have had a lot of discussions with uh, my uh, friends in the door hardware industry, Ron I've known for many, many years, um, and also in the electronic security industry. And again, how it's a, it's a complicated pro process and on most projects it doesn't go well. Um, between the integration of those two. So to find a solution before I retire is my goal. And so um, if this is standing between me and retirement, we gotta, we gotta, we gotta solve this problem. Thanks, Phil. 
Good morning. My name is Ron Couch. I'm with Central Indiana Hardware. I'm also on the board of directors for the Doran Hardware Institute. I've been in, in the industry since 1984. Started selling and promoting access control systems in 89. Uh, so I've been involved for quite a number of years working with owners, architects, uh, and general contractors. And as Phil mentioned, it's a very complicated issue, probably more complicated than it needs to be. A lot of different interests are involved in uh, the door security and access control and security hardware and auto entrances and you get many different disciplines involved and it's very difficult to coordinate uh, that and come off with a very clean good result uh, and it looks like we need to resolve this so you can retire right is that what we need to do okay all right should be no problem today Okay, so we have a, a, a dynamic speaker next door, so when you use the mic, bring it close to your, uh, your, your mouth, okay? Because sometimes uh, I think some of the audio from next door is overriding. Or we could get everybody to move to this side of the room and then the room would bend. I don't know which. Um, all right, so master format, once again, right, they implemented a change. And so what's non-integrated, what's integrated? And they introduced that terminology in, the ne in this latest version. Uh, they did that for some interesting reasons, which I think are going to come up as we talk through these and get questions. Uh, but uh, really, I think they did that for money, right? I think it's a money issue. I think money drives a lot of things. And um, so we, we need to, to talk about that. Um, so does the change help or, uh, or confuse us, um, you know, in terms of how this, this should be specified? And um, that's a statement, in my opinion, that you have to say it depends, right? And, and so those are up to you guys to explain why it depends, but it does. Uh, what are the implications for the ultimate owner? And is the ultimate owner the customer? Uh, I came away from an early discussion with these three gentlemen a um, month ago, or uh, give or take, right? And after that discussion, I got to thinking about the concept of money and ownership and who's the real owner and who is selling what product, service, or otherwise Wait, we have a manufacturer that's not at that table. He's hidden back over there. Okay. Anyway, um, so I think there are, you know, everybody's got to run your business. That's, you're, you're here to do business. You're here to make money. You're here to do a good job and get the job done. But you don't do it gratuitously. You do it because you get paid. And so when we think about the people involved in this process, we got to think about what's their goal and how do we as consultants and we as an industry best understand everybody's uh, issues and then bring that together in a way that uh, I like to use the term do it less wrong. You said, <laughs> you know, because it's not, it's not quite clean, right, with the hardware in, in, in situation. So we'll go into that. Um, what are the implications for the consultant and how does this affect the integrator and coordination among all the trades? That's where we are. We have several questions that we want to address. I'm going to put them up. They're all on one screen here. And so we're going to be talking through those various points as, as we go. And I'm going to ask all three of you to comment on them, hopefully in as much order as makes sense. I also suggest to those of you that are out here, all the consultants and manufacturers, to comment where you think a comment is due. So if you have a comment, a question, uh, I'd rather make it as interactive as we can. All right? So I'm the moderator, not the panelist. So when you ask me a question, I'm going to try to move it that way. We'll see how that goes, right? OK. Uh, OK, so. What, what do integrated and non-integrated mean? So I think what we'll do is we'll start with you and we'll run that way, and then we'll come back on the next question or whatever, I don't care. So we'll see. All right, there we go. Well, I'm sure there's a lot of debate about what integrated and non-integrated means. Uh, for me, what it means is uh, the difference between dumb devices and smart devices, I'll say. Uh, a device that's at the 
at the opening that uh, has little to no intelligence, I would think would be a non-integrated uh, device. An integrated device would be a device that would have uh, intelligence either at the door, through a panel, uh, through an interface, uh, maybe even talking to other systems like video and alarm monitoring. Uh, so it would be integrated with multiple systems is one way of looking at it. But clearly, uh, things at the door that are more like door position switches, electrified strikes, mag locks, and things like that are uh, something that I would view as a non-integrated product. So we'll start right off with, with disagreement is um, I, thought, I thought about this too and, and, and I, by the way Ray wanted us to disagree up here so this is good. Um, you know I got to thinking about it and, and I, I understand what you're saying but I haven't seen a, a, a door position switch. I think anything with a wire is integrated um, because a door position switch is still integrated with uh, some kind of a panel to do request to exit um, to do. Uh, forced entry that it's integrated. I, I really haven't seen, and I was even going so far as door hardware, you know, that it closes and latches. You know, it's not a, it's not a secured opening or fire opening if it doesn't uh, latch. But I think for this definition, um, I think it's almost any, and you can't go anything with a wire, anything that's powered, because now you have battery operated locks, integrated or non integrated. I would say that would be integrated. So it, it's almost, anything with power is integrated um, somehow because even uh, an EL device, uh, uh, um, this, it, uh, door position switch, name a uh, uh, door controller, automatic opener, somehow it's integrated. So that's my, and, and we, we talked about this on the phone the other day and we're going, oh, everybody knows that. And we were kind of, kind of arguing back and forth and we go, no, we better have this question. Yeah, I'm not gonna say who I agree with. I'll just give my opinion here. Um, <laughs> Uh, it, my personal opinion on this would be a, a non-integrated device would be something that's standalone. That's going to be a, a hinge on a device uh, or on a door opening. That's going to be the closer for it uh, that doesn't really need any interaction with anything else in the building to do its, its thing. Whatever it's supposed to do, it's going to do without being connected to another piece of hardware, either... Uh, a power supply or a controller, whether it's a dumb device that's just reacting the voltage being given to it or taken away, or whether it's a smart device that's you know reacting to a program that's given to it. Uh, no, no, let's uh, hold on, and then, and then you'll start the next one. But I've got a, a couple more uh, comments for you on that one. So. And, and, and then I'll get to you in just a minute. So hand him the mic, turn it on so he's ready. Um, <clears throat> so I think we've all seen a door hardware spec. And in it, it expects a door contact. And in it is a fire rated uh, assembly. And so hopefully in that spec, if it's in the architect's spec, and in that case, it's probably in what we call 08 section, right? It's likely that there's a line item that says what the door contact is that's expected to go in there so that the assembly comes from the responsible party that maintains the rating on the door uh, and gets in there with the right hole and often says uh, supplied under security. Right, so there's an accommodation to integration between section eight and section 28. So that's the discussion we're having today. That's a great example of, of what you've seen. And so the real question that's gonna come out here and, and um, you know, it will, we'll have it in various flavors and maybe Dave wants to ask it too. But the real question that comes in is, where do you think the most appropriate, and there's a lot of reasons why appropriate might be good or bad, where's the, uh, the right appropriate way or place to specify something that's more complex than a door contact, right? So where's that? So that's my open-ended discussion. Dave. Um, you talked about uh, automatic openers on doors or closers. Right. Uh, it's a power device, but if it's just standalone, if it's just a convenience to be able to open a door for 
ADA or because a mail card has to go through, then I wouldn't call it integrated. But if you have a card reader on that door, and now you have to drop a lock before you can, op you can operate the opener, um, does that become integrated? Or does that device still remain in 08, uh, but you connect to it anyway? I, that's a great question. Yeah, make sure it's on. Thank you. That, that's a great question. Um, and so as you're going through the construction process, and that door may not have a card reader on it to start with, and then it gets a card reader. And so I, I believe, I'm, I'm just trying to think through the process. Um, if, if it's in a different section now, you got to remember to move that door, that door controller um, into the security section. And, and I think that's where we forget to do that because so many times, oh yeah, we need to add a dark card reader to that door or we need to add a card reader to that door. And that doesn't get coordinated even around electronic locks. You know, to put, okay, we got a card reader on the door, but there's no ele electronic lock on that door. So again, I think just, uh, it's a difficult question, but I think it almost should go in the, uh, in, in security because of that, uh, whether you agree. Depend on who's gonna provide the device. And I think the same person is gonna provide the device, but there'll be somebody that will be the coordinating part of that, of that whole assembly. So um, we've got a couple other questions. We'll get to them. Well, just, just and you need to comment on, you're going to comment on what he just said, right? Absolutely. OK, good. Uh, I just want to make sure we're on I'm the thread here. I'm going to agree and disagree. Uh, uh, I see a lot of disagreement there. <laughs> yeah. Well, the construction documents really lay out who the responsible parties are and what section that comes in. The auto operators can sometimes even be in their own section outside of 08710 or, or, or 28. Uh, so it depends on how it's architected originally and how the construction documents are drawn up. But uh, regardless of whether it's integrated or not, on most all cases, it's gonna interface with other systems. Maybe it's the fire system. Maybe it's auto operators that are getting uh, turned off in case of a fire. Maybe it's working with an electrified strike, as you mentioned, that's powered off of the auto operator and not even tied into the system. It's just a, you know, a switch and a timer that's in the, in the device itself. So it's non-integrated with a access system or a security system, but it's self-contained, but it's interfacing in with other systems. So it, there is a lot of complexity. I think the key thing is really for the consultants to work with the architects to help them understand what is best for that particular project. And uh, healthcare projects, as a good example, have high energy operators and not just the low voltage operators. So a lot of times you'll see the low voltage operators in 08710. You'll see the high energy operators in a different section. Okay, so we have a question there and then there. Hey, Mark. Is this on? I'll, I'll stand so I'm not hiding in the corner. Um, Talk loud. So for me, I think the term doesn't matter, it's the definition matters. Just like security risk assessment, that doesn't mean anything until we properly define it. So the same for integrated and non-integrated. So historically, we're just reflecting the term integration that got adapted by the manufacturers to provide this new intelligent lock, which they call an integrated lock, and we're just reflecting that. So really it's just, what does the definition mean of integrated versus non-integrated? And my simple mindset, master format, all the specs, is how do we make it easy to communicate which contractor does which role? So it's really about what do we put in the different sections versus the specific terminology so we can simplify it and says, okay, door hardware contractor does this and everything else that's done by the security integrator points to division, division 28 and vice versa. So we're very clear on the expectations and therefore there's less confusion, less change orders, and so on and so forth. So ultimately, that's what really matters, in my opinion, versus the specific terminology, unless we're defining it well. And as we move down the role of IoT, you know, marketing term, but really integrated smart sensors where we're coupling multiple sensors in the same physical location on walls, on doors, and so on and so forth, everything is going to get pushed more to a Div28 Div or other electronic section outside of Div 8. So I think this is just the beginning of a long-term trend and it's really 
about what would we want the door hardware contractor to do versus what we want security integrator or other technology contractors to do. And Mike has a question too. Yeah. And we'll go back to our normal environment here. My, my question is, well, it's not really a question. It's a definition. We were talking about integrated, lo integrated locks. Well, to me, an integrated lock is a device that goes on the door that, that's integrated with everything. The card, it's got the card reader. It's got the door position switch. It's got everything you need to, to make that a secure door. Um, and to me, that's integration. That's, that's an integrated lock. And I, I think. So you would, excuse me, but you would say that the one that's in between that both Allegion and, and uh, Asa Alboy have that has a door position switch and a Rex in the mortise lock set is not integrated? Because it, it's not one of the ones that has the card reader and the logic in it. If it just has those three functions, the lock and the door position switch and the Rex, would you call that integrated? I'm just asking. I, I would still, still call that integrated as well. All right, so it's a, it's a dumb lock with three dumb things in it that do all it very well. That are right? integrated together, yes. Yeah. It, it's a tough question. It is a tough question. Great. Okay, that gets back to our panel. Then, did you want to comment on that tr chain before I, we go to our next question? I, I did want to comment uh, on generally when the coordination happens is about halfway through the job when everybody starts pointing fingers at each other, <laughs> and then they decide, oh, let's have an emergency meeting because now the contractor is starting to get these change orders flying around and. Uh, he's doubled up on power supplies and you know no one knows where their uh, scope of work ends and the other scope begins and they decide let's have a meeting and let's get everybody together and then it's everybody just jockeying for position that's a bad scenario that doesn't help the owner that doesn't help the construction process that adds to a lot of waste and hopefully guidance can come out right. uh, that can help the design community understand how to better facilitate this because it is complicated and it does involve several different areas. I think it is key to have more than just um, a, a, a by others kind of comment in the byline because if you're putting an electrified lock set on a fire rated door and there needs to be a raceway in there, we as a door supplier need to know what that specific lock set is it just can't be you know by others and we don't have any information we can't properly prep for that and then technically it can't be dealt with in the field without an, a, a tremendous amount of remediation and cost uh, but I would comment that if you had the model number of the device sure. and it said by others yeah what by others yeah. right okay so um, can, can I get one, one comment you may you know as we thought about Division 28 and putting more into Division 28, a lot of it was around serviceability. Yes. So coming from the integrator background, when that door doesn't work, okay, who do they call? They call the integrator. They call the integrator, and if the lock wasn't supplied by us, what do we know about that lock? Supplied being, that's why my comment was, it's still supplied by the same people. We might go to Ron's company and have him supply it through us. Um, um, but again, that's around the serviceability. The coordination is one thing before the project, but I'm thinking of the end user and what's the best for the end user and how many, you know, we, we do elevator, con uh, elevator control attached with elevators. Well, we've created a, a panel that's between the elevators and the access control system with a key switch on it. Because when the elevator didn't work at two o'clock in the morning, who'd they call? They called the integrator because the card reader didn't work when really it was the elevator. And so we said, turn that key. Does the elevator work or not? It doesn't work still. Okay, call the elevator contractor. So again, trying to, we'll take responsibility, but if we don't know what was installed or weren't part of that installation, that's what, again, that serviceability part is a big part of it. All right, so we're going to move on because we have several questions. And uh, so how does money play into this discussion? I know we're going to come back to a couple of things you said because I've got it in my head. So go ahead. Uh, thanks, Eric. Uh, adding on to a couple of comments earlier, um, 
you know, defining the the devices has got to be done and defining the scope has got to be done at the beginning, up close, who's providing what. Uh, and then moving into this next question, when that's done right is when the um, architect, engineer, designer, the one creating the bid documents uh, and the construction set, uh, you don't get the change orders back. You don't get the egg on your face because you did not coordinate that. Uh, and in my case at, at our company, that's me. If I didn't coordinate with the architect, the egg is on my face. Um, the, uh, it, it travels all the way down the line. We all know this. Um, it, from the uh, designers to the general contractors and ultimately all the way works through the construction chain back to the owner. And doing it right saves money down the line. Uh, lack of coordination is going to cost everybody money. Uh, money's a big part. I, I, I wrote a couple of notes and one thing, a design build versus a bid job, very different, um, very different relationships there where the contractor wants to get that next job, you know, with that owner and it's going to be a negotiated job for the general contractor. It seems like those coordinations are um, um, much smoother than those, um, than the bid jobs where kind of, it seems like everybody's out for themselves and spoke at ISC or as is a few years ago and there was a contractor in the, in the audience and he said the same. He says it's very different um, um, relationships and it's much more adversarial in a bid, bid job. You have to be more careful, you know, and, and it's almost CYA. You know, the way the bids are or the way the specifications are written. And that's why the specifications are so thick because, you know, those that have been in the industry a long time, the specs get bigger because every, every job you learn something. And so then you put a, put a, put a, put a disclaimer in there for, for that, next, that next job. So, again, the money part, it all goes back to the owner. And then I think the other thing is the maturity of the owner. So those, those um, companies that build a lot of buildings will take and, and um, say I'm the owner and help the GC help more than that, will we'll, um, drive the GC to what their requirements are. You get the, the organizations that don't build a lot of buildings and they don't have these construction managers involved that are looking out for their best interest. That's where it's the GC starts driving. They start taking this back and changing this back. And, and, and that's where I go back to, and uh, Jerry uh, in the meeting next, next door, it was like, it, we were talking about who owns the risk? You know, who owns the risk of the security system? Is it the facilities manager? No. Is it the architect? No. Is it the owner? Is it HR for that company that's really responsible for their risk? Well, to me, I'm, I'm more saying who, who owns the safety of the employees? HR. So again, trying to get up that chain to drive the standards down through, through the whole um, the specification process. It's not just a project. This is around safety, safety of, our, of the employees and of the customers or whatever you want to say. I think the level of complexity on the project is a big factor in who the decision makers are and back to what Phil was saying, whether it's a hard bid project or a design build project. When it's a design build project, it's, it's the whole process is much more collaborative and consultative. When it's a hard bid project, it's more adversarial and the money is made up on change orders and people are looking for these gaps in coverage so that they can make extra money because you're not good. If you go in, you're not going to win the job if you're high, right? You're going to win the job if you're low and you're going to hope for change orders to help make you somewhat whole on that project. Unfortunately, that's a construction process and it is a very clunky old process and it's not very efficient, but uh, we see when we have design build projects, they go much more smoothly, much more collaboratively, and it depends on the sophistication of the parties involved, including the owner. If the owner's sophisticated and they know what they want, then that's going to be, in my view, the best possible outcome. If the owner just knows they want, you know, something that they can timestamp people in and out, and they don't really know what tech the technology is, they just know that they're, they want a key fob, as an example, then the owner loses power and it gets turned over sometimes to capable hands, but more often than not, not very capable hands because architects don't specialize in the services that we do. And it 
involves life safety, it involves fire safety, it's securing assets and people. Uh, it's very important, uh, very important work that we do. And unfortunately, the architectural community doesn't have uh, as much of an expertise on it as they actually once used to have. Well, it's all the manufacturer's fault because they give away the, the designs of the hardware specs. I'm just kidding you guys. Only I, if I it's to their advantage. I'm just giving you a hard time, right? <laughs> but let me, let me say a couple of things um, that, that we didn't say about money that I think ought to come up uh, very specifically. Uh, and I, I would ask how many of the folks in the room have had situations where uh, there's a door, seats right here, come on up. Um, how many of you have had situations where the job progresses, there's an access control door, it stops working right, and it's an important door to a security owner? Uh, you know, he's got critical assets behind that door and it stops working. Next thing that happens, and, and let's say it's, it's uh, one month into a signed off job. It's all fine. Now we're one month later, all right? And so who do they call? To Phil's point, who do they call? They call the uh, integrator, right? And they go, hey, this door isn't working. And so the integrator tries to figure out why that door isn't working and comes down to a part which they knew about. It's not like they weren't involved in turning that part on. They know exactly what the part is. If we've all done our job, the part's specified. It's defined. It's not a question of that, okay? So it's one month after the job, the job's signed off. They get down to it, and it turns out it's the lock, all right? Usually it's not, by the way, but <laughs> it turns out it's the lock. And so um, then what happens, right? So they say, well, uh, that's not me. I didn't install that. That's not in my parts that I sold you. So it's not actually under my warranty. My warranty covers what I installed. So then they go, the, the owner has to go to the GC, which is disengaged kind of from the project already maybe, and they're, they've moved mostly offsite. Maybe they use one of those wonderful tracking systems for RFIs where they put it all online and they've turned it off. <laughs> I had that happen to me. I lost all the notes because they wanted me to put them all in the tracking system. I didn't keep duplicate copies. And one month after the job closed, they were gone and they weren't available. So that was cute. Anyway, so you go down and, and so the owner gets to the contractor and the contractor gets to the door supplier who might go to a sub that's a, a lock supplier and three weeks later, who's paying for the guard at the door? Now, and I say it's all about money, right? So if you had a situation that was that bad and that awkward, that's the type of thing which hopefully our discussion today will lead to some thoughts about how we resolve stuff like that. Because that's an awkward situation, and it's definitely money-driven. Definitely money-driven. So, Steve. Yeah, somebody give Steve the microphone. Well, the other piece that complicates that is also the fact that that dealer, depending on how nice they want to be, that integrator, may bill that client now for that service call that they had nothing to do with. They may, yeah. You know? Absolutely. So there's another factor of cost for that client that they, they don't consider. And right. I try to educate my clients that say, well, this is how we want it done. So, okay, well, think about these elements and what you said and the serviceability, and they're gonna come and say, it's not our, our problem. Here's, here's your bill. And so what happens, and in my case, what happens is I see owners that say, okay, forget about the fact that I supposedly paid for a warranty through the channel where I bought this you know, just go get the right part and put it in and I'll pay you because it's the cheapest, quickest solution for him. So during the construction problem, pro problem, it is probably, <laughs> during the process, the, uh, the owner loses money because he's effectively paying twice for a warranty in that case, right? So that's it's one of the nuances, yeah. yeah. Uh, two, two points, one of them is, and so then we, a uh, good customer, you know, that we'll, we'll dispatch it to in the morning and we'll fix that lock and then who owns it? We end up owning it. Somehow we own, own the warranty. As soon as we touch it, yeah. we own the problem. 
and that's that's a problem that can cost because it might be a bigger problem to change that whole lock and then as an integrator we got to go back and try to collect money from the manufacturer which we do and sometimes it might take a year and a half on bigger problems um, take take a year and a half to collect that money but we're trying to solve the clients problems by you know by helping them and not leaving them high and dry that 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 door has to be secure and they have nowhere else to go because the contractor has gone Another point, again, about the money is, and as we're talking bid versus, versus um, design build, it's when there's a um, uh, consultant involved, a designer consultant involved, so, mu so many times because of money, that design consultant does the design and, and then as soon as construction starts, they're not there. So unless we have a relationship with the consultant to go, what were you thinking here? Help, <laughs> not what were you thinking from a negative way, but, but just help, help me understand you know, what you were thinking. And, but that's money out of the consultant's pocket to, to do that because the GC and the owner aren't paying for them. And then that's when, the, that's when the fights really start. I mean, they get nasty because, again, the consultant's not there to protect themselves almost from the, the and, and, it's, and it's a free-for-all. So I think that's another money thing on how consultants can sell their way into the, the, um, the build part of it, you know? And again, I see more where they're just, they're specs written, now GC, and then GC has control, and then all goes to hell, so. Okay, let's, um, let's go to question number three, Ron. You get to start this. Uh, when's the right time to start coordination of all the components and how and what and talk about that coordination? In the very, very early phases of the concept and design of the project, uh, the owner needs to be involved. And again, depending on the sophistication of the owner, sometimes the owner may stand down and say, well, that's what I'm paying my professionals for I don't know that much about this I just know I want these doors to have some kind of access control that's important to me and then there are uh, very sophisticated owners that will even drive the design of their project clearly those results are going to be far more coordinated and, and better off than I turned it over to an architectural firm who doesn't really have the expertise. They brought in a consultant who kind of threw something together, didn't really run it back by the owner, and now it's out to bid, and uh, you know the confusion ensues very quickly after that. So I think it's also important to lay out, uh, to, to do a little matrix on all of the things that are gonna be surrounding that application or opening. Again, is it going to have tie into fire system? Is it going to have high energy operators? Is it going to have uh, you know, card reader and other uh, monitoring going on with that opening? And then it needs to be defined further on who is going to be the owner of those various components so that you can have it pre-construction, pre-bid, as opposed to midway through construction <laughs> after did you say as all hell breaks loose? Yeah. Okay, after that. <laughs> you know, I, th I think at the very beginning, and this is to get the, the architects to understand at the very beginning, that coordination, as soon as you have a portal, and, it, and that just doesn't even show the swing of the door, but as soon as there's an opening, and, and we're, we're talking, to, and you're, you're probably talking to security folks on which are the secured areas, and then look at exit corridors, because that's what I've seen just so many times where they, they, they bring in the consultant too late, so exit corridors are already built, and so then you, and, and they're going the wrong way, the, the way to secure them, and so, it, it, right, it, yeah, and so, and then mag lock, and put a mag lock here, you have to, because you hadn't thought that exit corridor through, and then you have to get local jurisdiction, and then it's brought in, and you look at this door and you go, brand new building, it's got all this stuff on it, because that coordination wasn't done at the beginning of the project around security, exit quarters, um, um, secured areas, um, um, so again, uh, it, it makes sense at the beginning, but I guess the question is here, how do we get involved at the beginning? What's the, to get the consultant in, at the very beginning of the project and how do you and and actually how many get involved very early or how many get in involved later than what you think that you should how many get in early enough 
how many get in too late? Yeah, 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 both. Yeah, yeah. Mike has a question here before you respond. Yeah, uh, the, I like to get in early, but the only problem, uh, the problem I see is the door positions change on a weekly basis until they freeze the drawings. So it's a. It, it's, it's costly. It's costly and it's a it's a game, you know. So what do you if you go in early, it's going to change fifteen or twenty times before you get to the end. So, I, and I don't know what to do about that. And I think it's the definition of what the consultant's responsibility is at that point. And again, components on the door, it's almost exit device. Uh, very not not part numbers and, and and as we do design we we, we think that thing you know, you're not going to design it as you're going to build it you're going to design it with three words you know this is what that door does again that's my 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 idea and so when they change the door eh, it's it's not completely redesigning the whole system but doing it in a, a a narrative form during that design development phase I don't know if it solves it but but to make it simpler and not design it for constructability until Everything's frozen, and uh, but to be involved in that. We'll get to you in a minute. Go ahead, Eric, and then. And All right, then we're going to have uh, first here. This is a three-way agreement. I agree also that we need to be getting in uh, as early as possible. Uh, as early as possible in my world where I'm living as a. I'll call it a consultant inside of a engineering and architectural firm. So many times I can just walk across the hall or I can get on Skype or links and link up with our architects that's doing this and it's, it's coordinating. For the consultants that's outside of that, that is an independent consultant, then yeah, you've got to be in early, early with that architect. And it is a process. It is a not a task. It's not something you do one time. You don't coordinate it, uh, like you very well stated. Um, it's it's a uh, it's a flowing thing. It's a plastic thing. It's it's evolving as it goes. And we all know that a frozen floor plan means that it's just kind of cool. It's, it's solidifying a little bit. A frozen flo floor plan is never ever ever frozen. Period. Um, so getting in early on, uh, getting those components laid out, working with the architect who is going to be the one putting that door schedule onto their documents, but 99% of the time we know that architect is not the one that's creating that door hardware schedule. So either working so close with them <laughs> that you can educate them and cause them to create edits that need to happen or figuring out who's creating that door hardware schedule in the background and feeding that to them, uh, being able to react to it then. So we'll go to Forrest, and then we'll go to you. Um, I wanted to kind of echo what Phil said about the narrative. One thing that we've experimented with in our process and our company is early on in kind of a schematic design phase is to create a narrative for each type of door because sometimes in, our, in my experience, the architects don't really understand if you show the components what that really means as far as the, how the door operates. So if you use just words, they understand that better, and then you go back and you, you, know, you add the components. So okay. I was, just wanted to point that out. I was just going to ask, how many of you as consultants get involved with the person actually writing the hardware specification? That's fantastic. That's good. Yeah, that's good. I mean, just a comment for, for our little company. We do, um, you know, not all projects go through programming, schematic design, design development, construction documents, and then, you know, get built. Those phases kind of get mushed around with lots of definitions and people and things. But there's, there's some time when all of that stuff happens, right? So for us, we have kind of given up and gone to the point where we, we get to the design development before the person is specifying the hardware, and we specify the hardware that is electrified for all of the access control doors at that point. So we're right at the end of design development. 
that comes out, that gets available to the hardware specifiers. Uh, we know all the ones in our area. We've got friends at Allegiant and Asa Abloy, and they almost always, one of those two companies, is doing that hardware spec. There are some independents. We know those two. Uh, and so that works out pretty well. And, and so we work with them as they progress. And as the doors change and they move down the hall a little bit and who knows what, right, then we have that ongoing dialogue. To your point, it's, it's time consuming, but it's, it's doing it less wrong, right? Uh, you've got a question there and a mic. There you go. I'm, a, I'm an end user. So I'm the one who gets the call at one in the morning when the badge reader doesn't work. How'd we let you in? I don't know. <laughs> Ray did. He was kind enough. But I, but I, but I have some, some, something to offer. So I've been doing this for 30 years. From, so my basis of design documents now 100 pages from all my errors and mistakes, right? Yeah, we all learned from that. Um, what I haven't heard talk about is one of the things that I found very handy was to have a typical design document right away for these doors. So the narrative is, is it a perimeter door? How are you going to use that perimeter door? And then I already know what, I don't have the specifics of the hardware. I mean, that's why I depend upon you. But I know what it's going to require, hinges, latches. And that's my checklist, right, to make sure I'm covering stuff. Much to Phil's point, if I put a badge reader on any door and it's going to be electrified, I know I'm getting the call at 2 in the morning that the door's broken and it's my problem. And to Phil's point, by working with the integrators, we found out, through a simple switch method, that the tech could go, flip a switch, and say, now move, work the door. If the door doesn't work, that's the door manufacturer. Um, if, if, we don't, if it doesn't work that way, then the, we know it's the uh, uh, installer. So some things to think about when you do this, because I, I would just come up with a typical door pattern first, and then go from there. You're one of the... Um uh, owners that we all like to have. <laughs> okay, uh, where are we? We'll go on? Okay. We've been talking a little bit about how consultants uh, position themselves to best influence the result, but we haven't really honed in on that maybe. So you've got a few minutes, so go, you can start. Well, I think it goes to my comment a minute earlier that staying involved through the construction process and get contracted through the construction process. Again, I'm not, I'm not on that side. I don't know how difficult it is um, to get that in, in the contract, but boy, that makes, makes our lives very much easier. I think um, also uh, to, to a point you made about, um, you, you know, there, there is a responsibility matrix, um, and there was before door hardware was moved to, electronic door hardware was moved to Division 28. And, you know, for who's doing the conduit, who's doing low voltage, who's doing high voltage, who's doing the, the, the card readers, and, the, you know, and to add that responsibility matrix into the specification so that everybody knows what they're responsible for. Um, I think that's an, another thing to, that consultants can do to own that responsibility matrix. What does a GC have to do? What does the owner sometimes? And now, as we're, we're getting off door hardware, but if these are electronic systems that sit on the network, who's responsible for the network? You know, and so again, that's where I think the influence that consultants have to be that end-to-end -end coordinator of who's responsible for these different things. Because the architect doesn't know about that. Maybe the engine, the, the, what I'm saying, but the, the fire engineer or the, the, the high voltage engineer doesn't know about that. But there are so many. One time I, I, I counted on a project we did, it was a, a 34 uh, 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 floor high rise. There were 25 different trades that we as an integrator coordinated with, you know, and I'm going, I, I, I put it at who coordinates with more, more than a GC would coordinate at all, but who coordinates more than the security uh, of that. So I think it's, it's a huge, as it gets more complex, there's an opportunity for consultants to, that know the complexity to be able to, to, to guide this group of um, um, people with all different um, uh, skill sets and uh, how they own the project. So anyway, that's my. In between, we have a question. Um, when you, uh, if you're going to break up the 08 to the 28, and there are multiple parts of the 28 that may be like a hinge, the 
pass through hinge may be part of the 28 versus the eight. I don't know how the manufacturers uh, Asa Abla would be specifying that for you. Would they be breaking that out between the 08 and the 28? And would that then the 28 condor have to be on site the same day they put the other two hinges in the door? Yeah, I just don't, just your thoughts on that. How, do the, how does it get broken up and then yeah, yeah. coordinated at, at installation time? You know, I, th I think that's, that was what kind of led me with the responsibility matrix and who's responsible for the installation. I think it can be specified in one place and then it's referred to to another section. So Division 28, again, I, I'd look, I've been in the hardware industry. I know how complex it is and how, you know, you do a hospital project for door hardware is much more complicated than a hospital project for electronic access control. It's just with kick plates and mop plates and, 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 and uh, how wide they are and how tall they are and electronic uh, exit devices. And again, I, I'm looking for the, the hardware supplier to specify them, but then it's how it gets supplied to the job. I think that's the, that's the responsibility matrix that, and I said it earlier, that we're supplying it, but we may go to Ron's company to supply it to us. Who's gonna install it? Well, we're responsible for the installation. Just the way we're responsible a lot of times for the installation of the wire. Do I as an integrator have my ASG technicians installing the wire? No, but I'm responsible for it and I'll get a low voltage contractor to do it. So again, I think that's, it, it kind of becomes more of a coordination effort. Now on smaller jobs, yeah, we, we'll, we'll pull wire, we'll install door hardware, we'll you know, do the whole thing. But I think it's the, I, I don't know if I answered the question or not, but uh, I, try, I tried. <laughs> and Ron, what, uh, before you, let's do this question and then we'll hang on. Is it mic on? Push it up. Yeah, it's on. Okay, uh, this is specifically back to how consultants position themselves best. Um, <clears throat> what I've discovered is that over the years of doing this that the best results come from a, a series of interactions throughout the life of the project. So in the initial phase and in what we call the schematic design phase, it's lobbying for and getting meetings with the building owner and the architect to discuss the security concepts for the project, discuss secure and non-secure areas, discuss how you're going to limit access to those, uh, so that as the architect starts finalizing their floor plan and nailing down the spaces, they already have that information in front of them. Then in the design development phase, it's lobbying for and getting meetings with the architect and their hardware consultant to now talk about each of the individual access points. How is it gonna be controlled? Uh, talk about a sequence of operation uh, so that as they're designing frame types and door types, if there's certain things you want to accomplish, certain frame and door types won't support that. And so they can talk about how that works. You know, a good example is like by swing exit doors in hospitals. Those are notoriously difficult to implement because of all the code requirements that have to get done. Uh, and then during the construction uh, document phase part of it, again, it's lobbying another round of meetings with the architect and their hardware consultant to now go door by door, what did you do and did it line up with all the notes I have about how I wanted to secure the space or how the owner wanted to secure the space. And then really the more difficult one, depending upon how you're involved in a project, if you're part of an MEP and T firm, it's a little bit easier because you already have blanket CA and, and project um, oversight. If you're your own consultant who's brought in as a third party, it's sometimes more difficult. But what we found is getting in your scope of work and in your fees, the ability to do a, um, I won't call it cursory, but it's like a supplementary review of the door hardware shop during submittals, because that's your last chance to see that the now the integrator who's been brought on the project and the hardware contractor who's been brought on the project are all submitting products that work together. And, and actually what we've wound up doing in some, some more complex jobs is inviting the owner to sit in on that meeting and we talk about the door operation one more time because sometimes we found that the hardware that got submitted can't actually perform all the functions that the owner was expecting that door to do. Uh, and then finally, having in your fee, your final field inspection, where you're part of the closeout on a door. So I know that's a lot of pieces and parts, and if your fee and scope doesn't include that, every one of those parts you leave out adds to uncertainty in the job and to more risk that what you want to design is not going to get done. Okay, Ron. Uh, quickly back to the question about uh, which section 
items fall in. I think one of the things that's beneficial <coughs> is to look at how that project's going to be executed because there are some innovative ways and some new ways that things are being done uh, that make it much more uh, streamlined and smooth for the construction process than is typically done in the past and that includes what we call in our industry pre-installation of hardware where we'll actually install the electrified exit device or the electrified mortise lock, run the wires through the door, run the wires through the hinge, all that's terminated and all of that's tested before the door ever leaves our shop and goes to the job site. When the door gets on the job site, then it just takes off from that termination point up through the frame and to the door controller or, or something of that nature. So you're not worried about what trade is installing this or how it's getting installed. It's being installed in a production environment, which is much more efficient than job sites. Job sites are horribly inefficient places to try to do any work. It's amazing we can get any work done at a job site with how all the trades are uh, stumbling over each other all the time. So if a job is going to be done that way, clearly it makes more sense to uh, have it maybe specified in one section rather than the other uh, and be pre-tested and pre-assembled as, as a total opening assembly. So, Ron, who's responsible for the service after that? Because the hardware distributor is a, a is a seven to five, normally, most of them, if you look at seven to five shop, they don't, service means, yeah, sometime in the next week or so. Um, when that doesn't work, who's responsible for that? And how does the end user get 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 that fixed in service when you do that? I don't know the answer, it, you know, and, and what you're saying is, you know, you get it installed in a in a, um, a n not on the job site is a better solution. But we still come up with who owns the warranty, how do they get a warranty, and does do hard. You know, we're talking about integrators having to change what they do. Do hardware distributors or you know the specifications for hardware distributors say you can only do that if you have a 24/7. Uh, line that has a service department, you know, to to because I think it's a great idea, but they still they, we need somebody to call to be able to say, hey, go fix the door hardware. It's not working on this particular door. So what, what what's the what's the answer to that? Uh, the answer to that is I think you've mentioned it, and and the owner representative in the room mentioned as well is having those clear lines of delineation between who is responsible for this aspect and who is responsible for that aspect, the integrator is going to get called. The integrator, by default, is dealing a lot directly with the owner and has a very intimate relationship with the owner. They're talking about their security needs and, and its scope of operation and things like that, where typically a door <coughs> hardware supplier is supplying material. But the lines are getting a little blurred. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the best solution, again, depends on how it's going to be executed and, and how it's going to be coordinated. And very honestly, if you execute it well and you coordinate it well, does it really matter? So I have a comment about all that, right? I, I think positioning the consultant, one of the opportunities that might be there in not all cases, but in some cases, is to put yourself in a place in the project, if you can, that allows you to negotiate with the general contractor and the owner's uh, uh, support. How the GC hands out the effort, the work, the responsibility, and everything else. Uh, and that includes warranty and, and the process of warranty. Because um, if you get the by, the by the CSI spec definition, if you get that contractor and they just want to hand eight to this guy and 28 to that guy and, and the other specs for the automatic door operator to that guy and, and the window wall. I mean, window walls, they're ridiculously hard, right? Because the conduit goes into a slab when there's a column line and you can see a piece of steel and it's hard to figure out what the center line of that piece of steel is. That's when the conduit for the window wall goes in that then has to get coordinated. So it's stubbed up through a piece of concrete into something in a big building that's 20 feet away on a rough piece of concrete, right? And it has to come up right through the right hole in the window wall. So we've got lots of interface issues we have to deal with. So if you can negotiate with the general contractor to the benefit of the job, 
and the owner, and if we think of the owner as the, the real client, right, then uh, often we can negotiate things like that. I'll give you a different example. It's not a hardware example, but um, you know and I know that a building gets built and the interaction with the GC kind of dies away pretty darn quick. But the interaction with the security integrator stays forever if they are symbiotic. And so why do we have all these jobs where the security integrator is stuck under the electrical under the GC, right? That's always awkward, right? So negotiating something with the GC where we want the integrator in those meetings, but we really don't want them working for the GC. We really want them working for the owner, in my opinion, anyway. It, it becomes more like a design and build job. So one of the things, money, we negotiate is a fee paid by the owner for what it costs the GC to put the management of the integrator into their construction process. Sometimes it's nothing, sometimes it's 3%, sometimes people ask me for 6%, you know, but that's a bit much. Uh, but we want them there during all the meetings. We don't want them to be this third party working for the owner that's shut out and told to come in the last week and do all the doors, because that doesn't work, right? But that's the type of thing you can negotiate with a GC. And so there's lots of opportunities, I think, for our industry, our room, to, to look at this thing because there's no question that it's not complex, right? There's no question. And there's no question that we've got all of these different pieces coming into it and that CSI has built a structure that makes it easier to define where to look for stuff in the, in the specification. That's all good. All right, so John, you've got a question. Well, it's more of a statement. Or a uh, statement. In, comp a comment. Comment. Uh, in regards to this gentleman talking about all the coordination you need to do in call coordination meetings, one of the things I get brought into a lot, unfortunately, is they fail to talk to the fire life safety people. And the first thing you're doing is you're starting to put hardware on fire doors. You don't know whether this door is part of an exit pathway. Is it an egress discharge? And the fun of having an integrator punch holes through a fire rated door and then realizing the rating is no longer applied or they cut into the fire rated frame and it's no longer a fire rated frame and they have to rip the whole thing back out of the wall. So please get, uh, we do that from the security side all the time is automatically look at your 101, talk to whoever their fire life safety consultant is and also interface all your security systems into the fire alarm because this is one of the areas I see get forgotten about all the time in the security designs. And we come in there and we start looking at it from the security side and I'm going, well, wait a minute, you're not, who drilled through this door? Because this is a fire rated door. Now you've got to get it recertified if possible. So just a point of contention. Absolutely. Um, hand the mic this way, please, to Ron. Um, I'm from the Texas Houston area. And I guess what I'm seeing here, this is ideal, but I, I don't obviously see this in Houston. Um, I feel like I'm, you know, this is a big issue for me. I can do all the coordination in the, you know, in the world. I, I, I've done the security uh, responsibility matrix that has assisted, you know, recently. That is something that's really helped us with all this, you know, change from integrated to uh, non-integrated locks. But it's not typical. Um, I will tell you probably 5% of our projects go this way. The rest of them, I can promise you and tell you, and this is anywhere from oil, gas, healthcare, higher ed, it's I'm after 100% CD construction. It doesn't matter if I was brought in during programming. The architect at that time either decides to do the door, you know, hardware themselves, or they bring on the door con you know, consultant, or, and that we have no idea what's taking place. Um, so what I have to do is, you're talking about positioning yourself to be a positive result. I've got to be more proactive. So what I'm doing is I got three or four sheets for every door roughing that you can have. I have every type of door hardware situation that I'm putting out there. And it could be based on previous project I did for the client. But I have no idea to the tail end of it. Um, and usually after an addendum, and, and you can say, well, what can you do to make it better? I'm, I'm trying. I'm even actually trying to create more details to do, or to do that because at the end of the day, I don't get that information. And then the issue that I have with necessary the 28 and 08, I don't really have a problem with it. I think, you know, some clients like it where, 
you know, if it's being wired, they want the 28 guy to do it, right? But the issue I have is that what happens to me often is that we'll design this traditional card reader on the wall, after 100% CDs, get a call, find out, that and nothing against the manufacturers here but they came in and provided a ve solution with an integrated lock set came in there and dropped a, a huge amount of you know ve in the cost of the project and now that's going in so now i've got a hole being cut in the door i got a hole cut in the sheetrock you know and then i found out that i'm liable for the division 28 portion of it that was done that i never even specified and then i'm now trying to solve a problem which i that's my job as a consultant but it's on, I'm trying to solve a problem that I haven't even specified. And that liability is, 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 is crazy. And so that's where we have an issue with that. Uh, I understand it's not, it's not really the, I mean, I've had this issue with the manufacturers in the room. They, I don't believe it's just them. They, they try to do their best to let the architect know, hey, we need to find out who your security consultant is. Same thing with us. We try to do that coordination. Um, I think they're brought in at the last minute and we're brought in at the last minute. So the only thing I can do, at least at where I'm at, is be proactive and try to provide documents that cover everything and hope to God that I get it. Um, but, you know, I just, you guys keep talking about this and it's just, it seems like it's like I'm going to Disney World. I mean, it's just, you know, I do not, I have never seen it happen this perfect, you know, or the way it sounds, you know. I agree with everyone, what <laughs> everyone's saying. Ideally, that should be the way. And it's not that we don't ask the questions. Um, I mean, I've gotten into programming and I've asked those questions. I mean, they asked me for a list of questions that we have. We, need to want, we want to sit down with the owner. We want to do this coordination. You know, but then you mentioned the coordination, all that coordination that you talked about. Some of that includes fees, right? So I don't know about y'all, but where I'm at, I get beat up on fees. I mean, if I try to put more than three observation visits in there, you know, they, they wanted me to come down on my CA or they want me to come down on certain fees. So, I mean, for me to be out there and go to every construction meeting, they're not going to pay me for that. You know what I mean? And so not that I don't want to not give the client something at the end of the day, but I mean, man, I'm, I'm getting enough to do my, what I'm, the basics, you know? And to, that's, that's also hard, you know, to that fine line, you want to give your client at the end of the day what they want, but then you got to, you know, the contractor is getting paid to be the management portion of this and managing their contractor. You got to give them some liability on this as well. Um, you know, it kind of takes two. And so we try to juggle that either through shop drawings, that coordination to make sure that the contractor knows what they're doing you know, but I don't know. This sounds too perfect for me, and I haven't seen it, so. <laughs> okay, so we're going to go back to our panel. We have just a few minutes. Uh, what's the desired outcome? And we'll start right here. Ron. Well, I think the desired outcome is coming up with good guidance for the industry so that uh, there's a, a better process that is an overarching process that uh, the design community can have and follow and understand uh, so that they're not trying to create it on a job-by-job -job basis and really make connections that they may not uh, know they need to make uh, and coordinations they may not know they need to coordinate. Again, I think a lot of that has happened through experimentation, which is another word for mistakes, right? And the more mistakes we've made, the better we've gotten as an industry. And, uh, you know, some of these architects aren't as sophisticated as they need to be on life safety, fire safety, and access control. They've given up a lot of that expertise over the years, and they focused on the design elements and not so much the functional elements. So if there is a way to put together a document that could be supported by the industry and, uh, and driven by the consultant community to say, hey, this is you know, the idealized scenario, Okay, back to, <laughs> back to your point. Uh, uh, this nirvana state that if you do it this way, then you'll have, it'll be less bad. Right. You know, I, I look at this last um, question as there's two things, and Ron, I, I, I understand what you're saying. You know, and I see this as an aspire to be, and I think to Ron's point, this is an aspire to be, and that you said there were 5%. Well, let's say a year and a half ago there was 1%. And so I, I, you know, I've been in the industry for 40 years and seen how slow it moves. And so, but again, there's this aspirational goal that if we, we have these meetings and, and have more of these meetings that, that the word gets out there and that, that the manufacturers are aligned to, um, to this idea of where security fits. And as security gets more 
uh, uh, complex, the systems get more complex, it needs more coordination for the security consultants to be involved. So I see that as kind of desired outcome of what we're talking about today. But also I look desired outcome of a project, you know, and a lot of time people answered on time, on budget, you know, work well with the contractors. Okay, those are, you know, kind of, kind of uh, symptoms or whatever. To me, the desired outcome is, does the systems we specify and install mitigate and manage the risk of our client? Right. Okay. And so, so it's, it's all about the client on, on risk. And so I think there's also, let me just go one back to the consultant's positioning. Here's an idea, and, and I haven't talked to you about Eric, but Eric's background, law enforcement, you know, he's been in the kind of the end user side of it. Is there a place for consultants? Because a lot of these end users don't understand what their risk is. And there's, there, I even saw a comment in, in the program about the end user's perceived risk. Many of them don't understand what their risk is. And I think there's an opportunity for folks with Eric's background and former security directors that consultants can bring on and sit down with those end users and go, before you ever start designing something, let's define what your risk is. Let's define it. So, and who owns the risk? Because the risk is scattered out, and there are, and then tie that into the design so you can go. Here's my risk. Here's the the, the installation of the whole information, or excuse me, of the construction project. Did it mitigate and manage the risk we talked about? That's getting in real early, but it gives you the, we, we, we do this, we have a consulting group in our business. We do that and it gets you to know the end user better. And so your, your first name basis with them, and it kind of keeps you involved in the project going, well, boy, why did, why did we do this? Remember, it was for the safety of the employees that we did this, not, not it was because it was a design requirement. You know, so anyway, that's just my thoughts ultimate desired outcome we all want our owners to get a what they need what they want and at the cost that they were told that it was going to come in at without you know additional change orders being slammed uh, I'm going to kind of bounce back up a little bit too um, positioning ourselves in front of that customer and in front of that architect whether in front of it is as face to face as we are or whether it's using technology now, WebExes, the links, the uh, Skypes, and those type of things. But that discussion has to happen, and it has to happen as early as possible. Um, get what the owner wants out of the system. What do they need? What does code say they have to have? Put that system together. Grab that architect's matrix and tear it apart. If you have to add additional columns in there, I personally have never walked on a single project site and my boots have stomped mud in thousands of them. Never have I seen the contractor truck that comes up that says other on the side of it. <laughs> I've, I've never been able to find these guys. So in my opinion, in design documents and contract documents, ones that people are bidding from and installing from, there is no place for supplied by others, ever. It's supplied by, and you tell them who it is, or you say, go look here in this other mm -hmm. spec, but coordinating those things up front on that, uh, on that uh, door hardware matrix, on that schedule, even if you have to add lines to theirs, do it, make that clear right up front, and the uh, desired outcomes will be met in a um, quality and inside budget. So we're right at the end. You have, Dave, a question, and you have a question. So you yeah, raise your hand. Mine's really more of a comment, and I don't think there's too many 501c3s in this room. Um, what the desired outcome, too, is profitability for everybody in a, in a happy you know, owner at the end. So, um, you know, I'm a preacher of harmony and humility for the consultant. You can make mistakes, yes you can. I know it, it happens and we have to own up to that and, and you know, not having to go out and win every battle with the integrated law. Well, I had this in spec, maybe you didn't see it. Uh, but I just think there's a lot of uh, you know, opportunity to make sure that all three parties are working 
uh, collaboratively. And um, you know, if you take one for the team, you've got one that you can use in the future. Don't try and win every day. That's good. So uh, you get one minute, and then we're done, everybody. So here you go, Dave. Okay. Um, one of the desired outcomes is not only to have the system working when we finish, but to keep it working. We talk about warranty. Warranty out of uh, Division 8 is nothing, I is useless. What we're typically looking for is a full maintenance contract from a security contractor who is going to be responsible for all the bits and pieces associated with the door, regardless of whether they install it or not. So in our specs, we say our first year maintenance, which we call warranty, but it, we, it's really first year maintenance, we say is going to be a full comprehensive contract, is going to include the locks whether you supply them or not, whether you install them or not. And I think that's the way that we, that, that's one of the desired incomes. Have one figure to point, or as somebody said, one throat to throttle, um, to make sure that the system, which is never going to be installed absolutely perfectly, I don't think any of us have ever had a single job that's absolutely perfect, but when it does go wrong, we need to be able to get it fixed and fixed quickly. And I think that's one of those desired incomes. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate all the time. And